Good afternoon. Bienvenida. My name is Stacey Stanislaw. I'm the Director of Communications here at the Libraries. And I'm just so excited to welcome you to the Hagerty Library and to celebrate the opening of this exhibit. Um, we're thrilled to have it here in, in the library. So Celeste is going to tell you more about the class and the project and the exhibit, as well as the Cartaneras republishing movement. But I did want to just take a minute to kind of reflect on how the libraries connects with this movement and, you know, why here? Why are we doing this? So for one, much like the artists and the authors who are participating in this movement in Latin America and other parts of the world, we're trying to provide access to, to information too. Uh, you know, the books, the journals that we have online for our faculty, staff, and students, as well as members of our, our community here in Philadelphia. Uh, we're a big proponent and supporter of the open access movement, which is a movement trying to make access to research freely available online to everybody. So those journal articles, the, the ebooks and stuff like that, just trying to make sure everyone can access it. On top of that, we're also committed to just exposing members of the Drexel community to different stories and experiences and ideas. We do that through exhibits and events like this one, through our resources and different things like that. So there was such a good connection, I think, between this class and the purpose of that movement and what libraries do you know, every day. Um, in fact, this is the second year we're hosting this exhibit. Uh, we did so the first time back in 2022. For those here in the room, some of the original books are on the on display over here. And then later today, for those again in person, we'll go upstairs to the lobby and you can see the 2024 books that were created, um, thanks to so many of the students that are here with us today. So I think that's it for me. I am excited to turn it over to Celeste and our panelists. They'll tell you even more um, about all that's going on here. So thank you, Celeste. Thank you, panelists. And of course, thank you, students, for creating these really amazing uh, pieces of art. And that is it for me. Turn it over to you. Gracias, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the opening of this Drexel Cartanera, Memorias al Carton, or in English, Cardboard Memories. We appreciate your coming to this panel discussion about our exhibit and the Cartanera movement in Latin America. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Gracias por asistir a esta inauguración de la exposición Drexel Cartanera, Memorias al Carton. Tenemos varios invitados que voy a presentar individualmente. Ellos hablarán brevemente sobre distintos aspectos de la exposición. Tal vez sobre sus propias experiencias relacionadas a la creación de un libro cartenero o el movimiento cartenero en América Latina. Voy a resumir en inglés los comentarios dichos en español, porque sé que hay algunos que no hablan español aquí en este público. We have several guests who I will introduce individually, and they will talk about different topics related to this exhibit. Some will speak in English, some in Spanish. I will summarize afterwards in English any comments made in Spanish. Before introducing the panelists, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. We are gathered here today on Lenape Hoking land that was once, was, and still is sacred to the Lenape people. It is here that the people called the grandfather tribe and the peacemakers have lived their lives, spoken their languages, and held their ceremonies for thousands of years before being subjected to removal and colonization through cultural suppression and erasure. In honor of them, let us pause in the Lenape way remembering where we are and who we are with, to be of one mind and one heart with all our relations, to remember the ancestors and to walk softly and carefully on our mother earth. With these thoughts, all right action follows. Aho, thank you. Okay, back to our exhibit, Cartaneda. Through the books in this exhibit, which are the final project of my course, Spanish 410, Performing Spanish, Proficiency Through the Arts, I have had the wonderful opportunity to get to know these students better and to witness their creativity, their confidence, and see their Spanish skills develop. But let's talk about what's going on outside of Drexel for a moment. 
Currently, there are independent publishers, workshops, community organizations making cardboard books, carteneras and catadoras all over Latin America. There's over 300 cartoneras in the world right now. Um, the University of Wisconsin has 2,000 cardboard books catalogs. This movement is grassroots and started with people recycling and selling cardboard to survive an economic crisis in Argentina in the early 2000s. And Luisa Cartonera was the first independent publisher of cardboard books in Buenos Aires in 2003. Some of the key characteristics of the Carteneras, these um, independent publishing houses, are the emphasis on cooperation, the rejection of copyright and mainstream publishing gatekeeping, and the use of refuse and recyclables to create something of value. And also the creation of new spaces to give people the opportunity to speak and to write and to make art who haven't been able to express or um, disseminate their ideas in the past. Um, y ahora en español, rápidamente, este proyecto basado en el movimiento cartonero latinoamericano me dio la maravillosa oportunidad de conocer más a mis estudiantes del curso Español 410 y para ellos demostrar sus talentos artísticos y creativos y poder perfeccionar su español. Este movimiento comenzó en Argentina, en Buenos Aires, en 2003, con Eloisa Cartonera, la primera que oficialmente fabricó y vendió libros de cartón. Luego abrió Dulcinea Catadora en San Paulo y surgieron otras cartoneras, otros, otras catadoras, otros grupos, otras organizaciones y redes de personas que fabricaban libros de cartón por toda América Latina. Características de estas iniciativas incluyen la colaboración y, co y la cooperación, el rechazo de editoras que privilegian ciertas voces sobre otras, la transformación de materiales considerados como basura en algo de valor y la creación de espacios y oportunidades para difundir ideas y voces que han sido reprimidas. Ahora escucharemos en inglés y español a nuestros panelistas. Um, we're going to begin with Jennifer Thorndike Gonzalez, who is a Peruvian writer and scholar. She earned her PhD in Hispanic Studies from the University of Pennsylvania. She has published two novels, two short story books, and her research work on the intersection between culture, illness, and health equity. Her novels have several reissues. Her stories are part of various anthologies and have been translated into Portuguese, French, Italian, Serbian, and English. She was chosen by the FIL Guadalajara as one of the 20 most prominent Latin American writers born during the 1980s. She has also won the Hatch Award for her creative and academic work and the Team Player Award for her work for diversity and social justice. She is the Associate Director of the Student Center for Diversity and Inclusion at Drexel University. Um, welcome, Jennifer. Bienvenida. Yes, yes. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to Celeste and Stacy. Uh, I am really happy to be here and honored to be part of this panel. Um, I have to apologize because I will have to leave a little earlier um, because I had a um, Another presentation, actually, that I have to do for the center, um, and and I have to leave because of that. But um, eh, I'm I am honored, as I said, to be here. I'm really happy that your class worked uh, on these projects. Um, this is something that I mean I see in those uh, books, and I am amazed because um, it's a beautiful way of doing art, recycling, and also showing. Uh, the art of different authors um, through this uh, through this movement that was uh, that was uh, started in Latin America. Um, so I can tell you a little um, about like my perspective uh, to what this meant uh, for writers um, of my generation. Now you know I was born in the eighties, so it's okay. <laughs> it was started a little like uh, with uh, authors that 
were born in the 70s. Um, so we are talking about the early 2000s, right? So in the early 2000s, um, as Celeste pointed out, this was started by three Argentinian authors, um, Washington Cucurto, which was born in the 70s, and two more. I mean, I think that Washington is the one that is more identified with the movement. Um, and it expanded all over Latin America. So in the early 2000s, I mean, like, if you can imagine, like, uh, as Sofia Petrillo will say, like, picture in the early 2000s, um, it was a moment. It's a Golden Girls reference, so you should watch it. <laughs> it's a really great show, by the way. Okay, so um, there, as, as Celeste pointed out, um, in Latin America, I mean, like, I'm going to talk a little more about my experience in Peru, but I think it could be translated to different countries because it had like the similar structure for the editorial uh, publisher houses. So it was very dominated by two big publisher houses that were called Alfaguara and Planeta that are like the biggest, uh, biggest publishers houses, houses that come from Spain. So they have um, their they were born there and they have like different, um, after that they started like having offices and branches all over Latin America. Um, so first, if you can imagine that it is like uh, to be a Latin American author was always like um, dependent on who published you obviously and the publishers houses were from Spain. So you see like that's some kind of trouble there, right? Because <laughs> of colonialism and everything, right? So the early 2000s was, was dominated by these two big publishers' houses that, as you might know, they published uh, the boom Latin American authors like Garcia Marquez, like uh, Vargas Llosa, right? So there was not a lot of diverse voices, if you want to say it. So um, what happened during that time, I published in 2007 for the first time, and I was at that moment a really young author. <laughs> um, and I was not part of the first part of the movement that started in 2001, more or less. So I was not a known author. I, I didn't publish at that moment. So I came a little late to the Cartonera movement, if you want to say it like that. Um, so what happened is that I would say that the Cartonera movement opened to something that later uh, were called the independent publisher houses and the small houses, uh, publisher houses, that actually, um, I mean, I think that that make us start thinking, I mean, like we can do um, this without the legitimization from Spain, right? So we can create this Cardonera movement and we can create these independent publisher houses. And that is started to spread all over Latin America, not only the Cardonera, but the independent publisher houses that were smaller. Obviously they didn't have a lot of money. Um, they, it was the effort of these people that also were authors that were passionate about literature, that were passionate about a lot of different topics, a lot of different voices and creating a new generation of authors you want to put it in that sense. Um, so um, I was the one, and I think a lot of my colleagues and friends that uh, have published during the first part of the 2000s who published in Independent Publishers House as the first step. Uh, so I did that. And um, the Cartonera movement was, um, I think, a place where you can uh, also expose your art without even being published in an independent publisher house, right? So you will see that, for example, the Cartoneras uh, can say like, oh, you have published, let's say, a short story collection. Do you want to like give us the rights to publish one of your short stories and make it like book like this? And most of the authors, or all of the authors will say yes, because this is a way I am like a new author. I'm trying to like spread the word of what I'm writing. Um, and, and and this is an opportunity for other people to read me. They might like me or not. That is not the, the, the main thing that we were thinking about is that the thing that, um, that it was a, a way of exposing more uh, voices. And I think this was very, very influential 
And it was not only like the Cartonera and independent publisher houses, not only to uh, to have like the room for more voices, but also a lot of, and, and that's what I saw at least at the at the first decade of the 2000s, um, that a lot of women started to publish, a lot of women. So we had like Latin America dominated by male voices, such American literature. And that was, historically so you have see all the canon and all the voices where most of them most of them were uh, male voices so when this started a lot a lot a lot of women writers started with the cartoneras or small publishing houses and the first books were published there um and if you see um I don't know the the latin american women authors that 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 are now have like a like have a lot of work, different works, different like have published in different, uh, different books. You are going to see that a lot of them started publishing in the, in the small independent houses and a lot uh, publisher houses and a lot also like contributed to the to the Cartonera movement. And I think that it was um, an effort uh, that at that moment we didn't think that it was going to be that big, uh, but. Um, but honestly, like now you see Latin American literature and you see the abundance of women writers that we have, and they are like so good. And I think that they are like, um, they are the ones that are dominating the Latin American <laughs> panel right now, right? I think so. I mean, if you see it, like you see Argentina, Argentinian writers, Peruvian writers, the Mexican writers, Colombian writers, most of them are by women. Um, I mean, there are also uh, uh, there are also men, um, but <laughs> there are a lot of them that um, that these are like the new voices, the ones who were young during that. That it was called like a young literature, you know, not young literature that's as a gender, but like people like young uh, writers. I would say like that. Um, that the ones that published in that the first decade, now we are older, right? But they still, still publish. And most, I, I would say that most of the people that started publishing during the 2000s in these houses, publisher houses and cartoneras, are the ones that are that had continued publish um, over the second decade of the 2000s. So I think that these movements were like really, really important. And without that, uh, probably I wouldn't have published, honestly. After that, Another thing happened is that, as I told you, that the big publisher houses, especially Alfawara and Planeta, both of them that I told you at the beginning, um, it started capturing all, <laughs> all the all the authors, and I ended up also publishing in 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 what is called now Penguin Random House, that you know it because is uh, is worldwide. They bought Alfawara, and now it's called Penguin Random House. And, and it's they had like several branches. They have one in Peru. So my latest novel was published there. So in the end, like we ended up publishing in the big houses as well. So uh, which I don't know. It's kind of like is it good? Is it bad? Um, I mean, it's what it is because a lot of independent publisher has closed. So and it was not because of the big publisher house. It was because of the market and a lot of several things. And that is another like topic of discussion. And briefly, because I don't think I have a lot of time, like from the perspective of me being uh, the, the the leader in the SCDI, if you have not gone, please go and follow us. By the way, um, I think, and I haven't thought that this could be some kind of workshop that we can do to, um, to let people, you know, publish in these Cartonera books their art and diversifying those voices as well. So... I think that it will be like a good um a, a good way of like one of my dreams for the SCDI, honestly, but I have not done it, is to have a, is to have a kind of magazine where students can publish poetry or shorter stories. I have not done it because of time always, right? But um this could be something like a first step because this has been, as I said, key for diversifying those voices, um, for, for sharing different types of art, different styles of writing, different uh, voices in the sense of not only um, the topics, but also how do you write, how like it comes from, 
from like you know there are like different ways of writing like what we call the voice in 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 writing um and it's different for each author for each culture cultural background so there's a lot of like i would say a lot of cultural items that you can find in these voices and if you start reading all of them or like different types of, of writers or different uh, diverse authors from Latin America, you're going to see that there are like some topics in common and there are some that are like, and you can find like different also topics there. So it's a really great, uh, it's a great opportunity to to know a little more about uh, our stories and, 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 and what we are doing and what um, at least, uh, from this um, not not that new now generation that has started publishing there. Um, so yeah, I think that I will stop there to allow <laughs> other people to speak. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, um, for uh, your perspective uh, as a writer. Thank you, Jennifer, your, for your perspective um, as a writer and during that movement. Um, and we're gonna go now to a student who is currently in the class, um, Tazneem Sadiq. Hi everyone, my name is Tazneem Sadiq and my experience with the with being in the Cardinera project has been amazing. And so my inspiration for, the, for my Cardinera project stems from a fond memory of mine of when I was about seven or eight years old, I was very stubborn when it came to eating a full plate of rice, which rice is a staple in my in my house. And so obviously my parents were rightfully concerned with the fact that I was not eating much as a child. So one day my mom was feeding me. And as I usually say at that time that, oh, so stop, I don't feel like eating anymore. So she stopped me before I could go. And she told me that, and she told me the story of the golden grain of rice. And so she told me that if you were to eat this golden grain of rice, you would gain magical powers. And so at first, but the catch is that this golden grain of rice, it blends in with all the other grains of rice. So that is what really motivated me, even now to this day, to finish every grain of rice <laughs> or to hopefully, you know, gain magical powers. So recently I asked her, where did this, where did this lucky grain of, where did this golden grain of rice come from? And she told me that it stemmed from both my religion and my Indian culture. And so when I told her that, oh, I'm actually going to make a short story about it, she said, a short story about it of this time she told me about the golden grain of rice of when I was seven, she was shocked about about like how I could even remember something from seven years old. But um, but she was pleasantly surprised with the outcome and she was very excited. And so all in all, this process through peer review of reading my classmates uh, short stories, it was really entertaining to see just how really their imaginations uh, reign free through their stories through their storytelling, as well as just how peaceful it was. I can speak for most of the class, just how peaceful it was to have a class dedicated to painting or book covers and making that itself was pretty much fun. And so to circle back to this amazing experience, uh, do, it's, it's also due in part, I would say, to our amazing teacher, Professor Aman, for really educating us on this topic because I had never heard of the Cardinera project before, but to also organize everything for us, but also my amazing classmates who really fostered an open and safe environment for all of us to, free, to freely express ourselves. And so this is all really ties into the amazing experience that I have at the Cardinera project. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tazneem. Gracias. Um, then we'll, oh, Stacy, do we have our... We do, sorry, it was making noise. <laughs> <laughs> there was smoke. I was just trying to <laughs> quietly uh, toss it. It looks like Raina has joined us, so let me... Okay, so we're going to hear now from um, Reina Casares, who is speaking Spanish. She is a community leader. Um, Phil Latinos radio host and a multidisciplinary artist. Um, Reina va a hablar en español. Ella es una líder de la comunidad y también trabaja con el radio, la radio Latinos Radio. Es una anfitriona, um, una periodista y un artista de muchos tipos. Bienvenida, Reina.
That's a mute. <laughs> she's muted. Yeah. That's she's a mute, Reina. Looks like she's muted. Sí. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias a todos por su presencia, en especial a Celeste, a Drexo y al proyecto de cartonería por hacer esto posible. Eh, me siento honrada eh, por la importancia que tiene la educación en nuestra comunidad latina. Sé que hay muchos jóvenes en diferentes universidades de padres latinos y la importancia también que es la lectura, la escritura y promover la cultura en diferentes áreas en este momento en el que, bueno, realmente eh, lo único que nos hace más poderosa es una difusión asertiva. Y la difusión asertiva, bueno, quiere decir que vamos a venir de fuentes que realmente están haciendo algo por movimientos para crear, para seguir haciendo cosas que van enriqueciendo y que nos van informando. Eh, como Celeste lo, lo dijo, Sí, efectivamente, eh, pues por todo el movimiento que se ha hecho aquí en Filadelfia desde hace 17 años, en este momento, eh, pues la comunidad eh, me conoce como activista, como un poco de activismo, artista multidisciplinaria, eh, y he tenido la oportunidad de colaborar con diferentes organizaciones, eh, pintando, creando ideas, curando eventos, y talento y comunidad, ha sido para nosotros eh, pues un sueño que tenía yo desde hace 12 años, que la comunidad se conozca entre sí, eh, no solo por sus talentos, sino por la necesidad de conocernos y expandernos. Y creo que el propósito se logra el día de hoy, eh, con promoviendo esta clase de, de eventos en, en librerías, en universidades, eh, transcribiendo verdad con, con cada una de nuestra presencia pues el, el poder que enfatizamos dentro de las familias y allá afuera en la calle, a través de lo que es la lectura, el arte y la cultura. Gracias, Reina. Um, she is honored to be here and um, she recognizes the importance of writing and reading. Um, for the community, for all of us. Um, she's participated in a lot of movements, a collaborative movements. She's known as an activist here in Philadelphia for over 16 years. She's um, collaborated and tried to bring out um, the community, the talents of the community. And also she feels like this, um, an event like this is um, what, what they're working for to have this um, connection um, between the community, the university, um, culture in Latin America, as well as literacy um, being important for all of us. Así es, es Celeste. Eh, gracias por la traducción. Me, no quiero hablar muy rápido tampoco. Eh, <laughs> eh, eh, el, 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 el proyecto de cartonería a mí me interesó mucho. De hecho, bueno, he preguntado por las fechas, cuánto tiempo va a estar expuesto. Creo que esta clase de proyectos debería de, de seguir avanzando no solo en, en un área de universidad, sino a partir desde el kinder, del jardín de niños, porque eso, eso nos motiva, porque igual se está usando un material reciclado, eh, eso también nos está permitiendo eh, diversificar con otras culturas. Entonces, en estos tiempos que tal vez la lectura para muchos se ha vuelto más... Eh, de audiolibros, de cosas de pantalla, y nos hemos olvidado de, del tacto, ¿no? Y de las cosas que podemos utilizar leyendo, creando y aportando. Entonces, eh, sería para mí, pues, un, un honor, ¿no? O sea, voy a andar por allá por Drexo y, y, y comunicando aquí en escuelas y a través de mi programa, eh, pues, eh, en la sede que tienen ahí en, en, en la librería para que la gente asista y que tal vez esto también eh, llegue a otros espacios donde se pueda colaborar y se pueda seguir eh, esparciendo esta clase de actividades, que no cuesta mucho más que las ganas de querer hacerlo y también eh, poder hacer que los padres de, de familia, de nuestra comunidad latina específicamente, puedan participar más eh, con sus hijos en, en otro ambiente, ¿no? en otro ambiente escolar, y que esto también nos permite eh, la alfabetización eh, tal vez la gente piense, ¿no? Pues todo el mundo sabe leer, todo el mundo sabe escribir, no es verdad. Hay mucha gente que viene de, de otros países sin saber leer y sin saber escribir. 
eh, y esto nos conecta, nos conecta para también a ayudar a la gente a seguir aprendiendo acerca de, de estos programas a través de una alfabetización este, pues muy creativa porque tiene, tiene muchos puntos a favor y que también nos permite estar con gente que nos puede orientar hacia otros sitios para seguir aprendiendo. Okay, so um, Reina would like to know more about um, when this project will be available in the library to um, pass this information on to the community. Um, she thinks that this should be something that happens starting in kindergarten, that we could do something to bring this kind of project um, to school children um, and some of the strengths of it being that um, it uses recycled materials. A lot of uh, the reading these days is happening digitally and we've forgotten about um, actual books and things that you can touch. Um, there are other spaces within the community um, beyond the library that could promote um, a project like this and also help parents to participate with their children in um, literacy and arts. Um, and it just would connect people to learn more about culture, especially in the Latino community. Así es. No sé si alguien te, tenga una pregunta o hay algo que quisieran que, que puntuara más en, en algo. Si no, pues seguimos. Anybody have a question or a comment from Reina? Should we just continue? Okay, muchas gracias, Reina. <laughs> gracias a ustedes. Okay, um, now we're going to hear from another student. Vamos a escuchar a Caroline Vitskovitsky. Um, she's in the course this year. Okay, everyone. Yes, yes. Um, yes. Yeah. So I first heard about the Cartoneros movement almost two years ago. It was shortly after the last class finished their uh, books. And I was in a class with Professor Mann, and she mentioned the project and showed us some of the books, and I was so intrigued by it. And I was really jealous that I missed out on that. <laughs> um, and so imagine my joy when two years later, I went to register for a Spanish class and I found out that this was one of the options available and it worked with my schedule. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, I signed up. I was really excited from the beginning, um, brainstorming stories. And I had to do two books because I'm in independent study. And so for that extra credit I was getting in Spanish, I did a little bit of extra work. Uh, one of the books was inspired by a bedtime story I told my little siblings uh, probably like six or seven years ago. It was about a centipede because I hated centipedes. And they were like, well, tell us a story about like a nice centipede. <laughs> so I did. Um, and I've always remembered that story. They've asked me to tell it again, and I could never remember it. But when I knew I had to write a story for this class, I wanted to try and remember that story. Um, and actually, I really liked Reina's point about getting younger kids introduced to this at an early age, because I ended up talking to my youngest brother about it, and he's eight, and I said, do you remember that story about the centipede? Do you remember what his name was? And my brother was like, no, I don't remember his name, but I do remember the story. So we talked and, you know, figured out some details that he could remember, and then we started writing. And I will say I did most of the writing, but um, <laughs> it was very, very cool to see how engaged he was because he hates handwriting. He hates telling stories. And yet for this, he was willing to make an exception. And after I told him about it on his own time for days on end, he went and wrote out different details that I could incorporate into the story and names for all the characters. And he would text them to me every day and be like, do you like this? Do you like this? Um, and it was just incredible and great bonding for us. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm very proud that I was able to share that with him and get him so interested in writing his own stories. Um, and then my other story was actually inspired by a prompt we had in class for our journals. And it, the prompt was, imagine you're uh, on a pirate ship for a day. What does a typical day look like? And so I kind of ran with that and wrote a story about a girl who was living with pirates because she'd been kidnapped. Um, and the story kind of wrote itself. I got a little carried away. I don't know if you guys can relate to that or not. 
Um, but <laughs> poor Professor Marin. I don't know if she's finished the story. Yeah, yeah. 30 pages. <laughs> <laughs> it was very long. <laughs> and I had so much fun writing it. And I was up till like three, four, five in the morning, so many nights, just because I was so passionate about this story and about these characters and just living their lives with them. And then when we got to the painting phase, I was like, okay, so I'll put less of myself into this because painting is not my strong suit. And I was like, I'll just find something to kind of like trace out and then we'll be good to go. And that's not how it went. I also got carried away with that. <laughs> um, and yeah, but the final result, I'm really proud of. And yeah, it was just an incredible experience. And I think one of my favorite parts was seeing what everybody else did, just the creativity you all had in writing your stories and in the techniques that you used to paint. It was really, really inspirational. So thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Muchas gracias. Um, now we're going to hear from Dr. Steve Vasquez Dolph. Vasquez Dolph, um, my colleague. Um, he is an associate teaching professor of Spanish in the Department of Global Studies and Modern Languages at Drexel University, where he also serves as a teaching faculty fellow for the Lindy Center for Civic Engagement and Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the College of Arts and Sciences. His teaching and research situate the intersection of migration and climate change in the Americas with a particular focus on food and land sovereignty projects in the Caribbean diaspora. Steve's teaching practice is rooted in longstanding partnerships with community-based organizations in Philadelphia and Puerto Rico, whose educational missions he supports through coursework, research collaborations, and co-learning experiences. Working principally from his identity as a child of the diaspora and his perspective as a first-generation American, Steve works intentionally to expand access to and diversify participation within community-based global learning programs and higher education. Gracias, Steve. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Mann, for including me in this panel. Uh, thank you, Stacy, for welcoming us to the library and for hosting this beautiful project. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to speak very briefly about my own experience with Cartonera when I was a student. Um, I was really fortunate um, to be able to get a grant to travel to Buenos Aires, Argentina uh, in 2009 uh, to study environmental literature and to look at some of the landscapes that featured in the work of Juan Jose Sayac, which is a like an early 20th century Argentine writer. Uh, and my job when I was there was to uh, look at some of the estuaries around the uh, Rio de la Plata and to talk about the ways in which humans and the environment were interacting. It's like a very like theoretical, high concept literary project. Um, what I didn't know is that when I flew in to Buenos Aires, and took a taxi from the airport to get into the main part of the city, I would be driving through miles of improvised communities, uh, housing that was made in large part by through recycled materials, desechos. And so many people were uh, living on the outskirts of Buenos Aires in basically cardboard communities. Uh, I didn't know that. I didn't have any sense of that before I uh, embarked on this literary environmental studies research project. Um, and it was really eye-opening. I was approaching environmental studies from like a purely literary perspective and not really thinking about the social or economic concerns of the people who's, who were living in this, in this environment. And it was like a turning point for me um, to know that the, a lot of the environments that I was looking to study were actually uh, inhabited by people, right? People living under extremely precarious, fragile conditions. And it changed my perspective about what environmental studies should do and what it's for. Um, I was really fortunate that when I was in Buenos Aires, uh, I was able to visit Eloisa Cartonera and see the kinds of work that was being done there and the books as they were produced and as they were being sold and interact with some of the bookmakers there. Um, and to realize that like people have this creative power uh, to remake uh, their circumstances or remake their conditions through art. 
that is um, transformative. Um, and that people have relationships with their environment and with the conditions that they've been handed that aren't just like one-to-one. -one. People can change the way that they engage with their environments in ways that are revolutionary. Uh, and um, that was a really important moment for me. And like it was facilitated by interaction with these books and with the people who were making them. Uh, so I feel grateful for that experience uh, and grateful to be able to talk about it here. Um, I shared in English, but if anyone wants to ask me a question in Spanish, si cualquier persona uh, le gustaría hacerme pregunta en español, yo puedo en español también. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, entonces, uh, finally, we will end this part of the discussion with a video from an alum of Drexel, Diana Velasco. She took this course in 2022 and was part of the first exhibition. And Diana is a busy person. And she's a grad student now. And so she was un unable to be here in person um, due to all of her commitments. Let me tell you a little bit about this graduate student. And I'm going to um, read her bio in English and then in Spanish. And then we'll watch the video, which is in Spanish and subtitle. Um, Diana y Velasco Manzano is a first generation Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian immigrant who graduated from Drexel University with a BS in film and television and a minor in Spanish. She is currently pursuing a master's degree in communication studies at Kane University in New Jersey. In her previous roles, Diana focused on language accessibility through her work as a Spanish to English translator on the documentary, documentary Como Vivimos, directed by Aji Ibrahimi Basaz, and she used her skills to create digital media content for the nonprofit organization Change Makers Hub in Cape Town, South Africa. Currently, she is working with the Center for the Positive Development of Urban Children at the John S. Watson Institute for Urban Policy and Research at King University as a graduate assistant. Her work focuses on data collection and further research into the importance of mentorship for teachers to connect with cultural empathy so that they can continue to cultivate a richer and more successful educational environment for students in the Garden State. Diana's academic and professional journey is motivated by a commitment to create a safe space for self-expression within the communities that she has the honor to be surrounded by. Rooted in the belief that every individual deserves to feel empowered, represented, and valued she dedicates her work to hopefully be a catalyst for progress and inclusivity. In her free time, she enjoys classical music, watching movies, playing video games, and learning to crochet. So I've abbrevi abbreviated the bio a little bit into Spanish, um, but for any of our Spanish um, speakers watching, un poco sobre Diana. Ella es una inmigrante ecuatoriana de primera generación. Se graduó de la Universidad de Drexel en 2022 y estudió televisión, cine y español. Ahora es estudiante de maestría en los estudios de comunicación en la Universidad de Kane en New Jersey. Hizo varios proyectos de traducción, documentales y otros proyectos con organizaciones en Filadelfia y Sudáfrica. Actualmente como estudiante de maestría, trabaja con uh, the Center for Positive Development of Urban Children, el Centro de Desarrollo Positivo de Niños Urbanos, at Kane University in New Jersey. Diana cree que cada individuo merece sentirse empoderado, representado y valorado y es la, motivis, motivis, es la motivación de su trabajo. En su tiempo libre, disfruta de la música clásica, um, uh, ella ve películas y juega videojuegos y aprende a hacer crochet. Um, now we will see her video which is in Spanish with English subtitles, which she made herself. Hola a todos y bienvenidos a la exhibición de los proyectos Cartonera de Drexel del 2024. Mi nombre es Diana Velasco Manzano y quería agradecerles a todos por acompañarnos hoy día en siendo parte de este movimiento artístico tan lindo e impactante. 
Antes de que comience, quería reconocer el trabajo de la profesora Man y darle las gracias por invitarme a ser parte de este panel y también por ayudarme a encontrar una solución para que pudiera comunicarme con todos ustedes virtualmente. Entonces, muchas gracias. Um, también quería decirles gracias a todos mis compañeros panelistas que van a compartir con nosotros hoy y también a todo el equipo que hizo este evento posible. Entonces, un grande aplauso para todos. Bravo. Um, un poco sobre mí, yo me gradué de Drexel University en el 2022 con un bachelor's en cine y televisión y ahorita estoy estudiando en la Kane University en Nueva Jersey para mi master's en comunicaciones. Um, y para mí el arte siempre ha sido algo muy importante que tiene más significado que solo entretenimiento. Um, yo creo que como artista, yo pienso que el arte es un símbolo del espíritu humano um, que destaca sus, su progreso, sus fracasos, sus debilidades, su amor y también su poder. Um, es una manera de poder alcanzar a la gente alrededor del mundo Um, y darles la oportunidad de poder sentir que tienen una voz, que tienen representación y que la esperanza y la justicia va a sobresalir con el uso de nuestra arte y, y las historias que contamos. Um, por eso, para este proyecto yo me dediqué a usar mi libro como, eh, en ciertas palabras, una historia viva. Um, entonces yo quería que sea como un punto de inicio para cualquier persona que encontraría mi libro. Um, y yo quería que mi libro de cartón sea una inspiración para que ellos vayan y cuenten sus propias historias. Um, y con eso pudiéramos comenzar un ciclo de narración dentro de nuestra comunidad aquí en Drexel para mantener nuestras historias y legados vivos. Um, y por eso es, es esa frase que usé antes, una historia viva no acaba conmigo, eh, sigue con la próxima persona um, y esa próxima persona va a tener otra persona. Um, y creo que eso es algo bien especial. Eh, por eso movimientos como cartoneras son tan importantes porque podemos ver realmente que nuestras palabras, um, como somos nuestros recursos, y como somos nuestro arte, tienen consecuencias que cambian a nuestras comunidades um, para lo mejor, yo creo. Y el título de mi libro es Tratando de encontrarme 38 mil pies en el cielo. Y es la historia de cómo vine a los Estados Unidos y cómo se ve esa experiencia a través de los ojos de una niña. Diseñar y escribir este libro, um, eso fue, esa fue una muy muy sagrada experien experiencia para mí porque fue el chance de reflejar en mí misma y en el trayecto que ha tomado mi vida. Y como siempre he dicho, es mi gran honor y privilegio, privilegio ser inmigrante y poder contar mi historia usando métodos de reciclaje, activismo y accesibilidad que nos ha dado el movimiento cartonera. Me ha ayudado a ser una, una artista que todavía piensa en eso um, y que eh, piensa en siempre usar mi arte como eh, algo que puede tener impacto y bueno, no puede, pero que siempre tiene un impacto um, a las personas que que estoy uh, enseñando ese arte o que encuentro en mi arte. Entonces, así, muchas gracias una vez más a profesora Man por invitarme hoy a hablar un poco de mi experiencia con este proyecto como un artista y también por siempre apoyar eh, el, el trabajo que hacen los estudiantes y tener exhibiciones como, como estas. Uh, me siento muy honrada y muy agradecida, muy agradecida por esta experiencia. Um, y aunque a la distancia, también eh, por ser parte de esta conversación con todos los maravillosos panelistas y miembros de la audiencia que nos acompañan hoy. Um, y finalmente, que disfruten esta exhibición. Uh, hasta luego y felicidades por ser par parte de este momento. Uh, muchas gracias y sí, hasta luego. Gracias. <risa>
Ok, gracias a Diana y todos nuestros panelistas también. Uh, thank you to all the students that has participated in this. Um, do you all want to stand up in the audience so that uh, people know who you are? If you want to, you can. If you feel embarrassed, you don't have to. <laughs> See? <laughs> These are the wonderful students, um, people who created uh, this exhibition. And I feel, as everyone here, honored to be here and honored to have taught them. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, I think we have maybe five or 10 minutes for questions, Stacy. Absolutely. Um, does anybody have questions that they would like to ask um, the panelists uh, in Espanol or English? Yeah. Um, it's the general question is, do you think that copywriting is a way of kind of limiting authors um, and like excluding, you know, the ability to publish? The question. Steve, do you want to answer it? Or? <laughs> I wish Jen was here. She, yeah. she could talk yeah. about that in more detail. Yeah. Um, I think it's both sides, right? On the one hand, uh, copyright uh, concentrates knowledge around people who have the power and resources to circulate it. Um, and But on the other hand, copyright does protect uh, the rights of, of creators in the world. Um, I think it really depends on what the distribution uh, models are like. I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert in publishing. I don't, I don't publish works, and so I can't really speak to it in that much detail. Um, but I think it's really important to always support open access movements, like what the library is doing, uh, and to seek out through your librarians, um, and to push them to create more, uh, uh, channels for open access information. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I can speak very briefly, but yes, please contact your librarians and they can help. And again, I'm just like a voice floating in the ether for online friends. Uh, but open access is a great way to extend that copyright uh, under most open access models, the author retains their rights to the publication, which is a huge issue. Um, so then they can share it freely with other people uh, and other people can also kind of reuse and remix their, their articles, which can be really great for research. Um, that's a, probably a story for a, a different day, but we're happy to share information about open access. No, no, it's a great question. Um, library staff can help with open access, with copyright in general, how to navigate all of that if you're publishing a book or a journal article or anything like that. So please stop by, talk with our staff, email us. We can always help. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very it's a very interesting question, which I'm not going to say anything uh, because we could go into a long yeah. discussion about it. But I think um, both Stacy and Steve pointed to the, the point that it has its plus and minuses. Um, and it's different almost with every country how, how copyright is handled. Uh, it looks like Raina has her hand raised. So please, anybody in the audience, feel free to type in chat or you can just unmute and ask your question. Pues más, más que una, una pregunta en este momento, eh, realmente para mí es muy conmovedor el video que acabamos de, de ver, una de las participantes. Como, ma como madre migrante de una niña nacida en este país eh, y, la, y la travesía que, que tenemos que hacer cada día y que se ha normalizado esa situación de, 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 de la migración de la forma que sea, en una forma legal o una forma eh, pues eh, que uno a veces eh, tiene que hacer, eh, me inspira como jóvenes a través de la mano de los profesores, en este caso que la maestra Mac, inspiran a través de su arte, a través de, de su cultura, y sobre todo cómo abrazan con amor un proyecto para seguir difundiendo eh, solidaridad y educación. Entonces, no es una pregunta, es una felicitación a todos los jóvenes que están ahí presentes que hicieron esto posible, que ya es la segunda vez, a la maestra Manuel, todos los que están ahí, eh, pues se me quiebra la voz porque realmente es, es estoy orgullosa de, de la chica que habló y estoy orgullosa de todos ustedes, porque eh, así es como queremos ver a los jóvenes, 
así es como queremos proyectar los adultos y la gente de la comunidad un impacto positivo que siga creando a través de diferentes este, disciplinas la conexión entre seres humanos, sin importar tu raza, tu color ni tu idioma, y que así como se normalizan tantas cosas, se normalice crecer, se, se normalice crecer con educación, con principios y con amor a lo que está alrededor tuyo, ¿no? No es fácil, pero definitivamente estoy muy orgullosa de todos ustedes y pues la que les aplaude soy, soy yo, porque pues, espero, espero ver más jóvenes, no solo de Drexo, de diferentes lugares, haciendo este, este talento y comunidad que, que representan los niños. Gracias. If we um, interpret what she said, she's very moved by this video that Diana made, inspired by um, Diana and all of the young people here. Um, it's wonderful to see how they are progressing with the education and um, how, how they're participating in this kind of um, uh, project. Her, she has a daughter who was born here. Um, so as a mother, um, she's speaking. And... Um, Proud of everybody. Well, I would like to ask a question to those who are CT. <laughs> uh, what was your biggest challenge? <laughs> or do you didn't have any challenge? <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know, that is uh, Dr. Dr. Luz Matas Mendoza, Matos Mendoza, my colleague from Spanish. <laughs> So no challenges. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> um, my biggest challenge I feel like was just picking what to talk about because we did a lot of like activities that helped us like brainstorm, um, like I don't know, different ideas that we could use. And I had a lot of like interests, but I didn't have anything that like pulled me specifically. So I think it was just choosing what to write about. Oh, Isabella. Um, I also didn't know what to write about, but I really like to draw, so I ended up just choosing, like, something that I would like to draw, and then, like, writing a story around it, so, yeah, it's pretty fun. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Oh, Roy. <laughs> um, I believe someone mentioned about when Cartoon Edwin has sort of died down a bit because independent, independent publishing houses have faded away um, in modern times. Do you think that's in part due to the rise in technology as a medium to express? Um, and I kind of think it has like a double sided answer, like technology provides them more information, but it also um, allows the people who have the ability to control the dissemination information to uh, favor uh, certain perspectives. Well, um, what Jennifer was saying was that um, out of this Cartoneta movement came these independent publishers in Latin America, which was, I think, an improvement um, from what they had before. They were dealing with big publishers, two big publishers she mentioned, and they were, you know, basically gatekeeping um, a lot of people couldn't get their work published. But I understand your question about technology, but I don't think that this movement has died down. I mean, um, I found out yesterday, it, it's just like, it just keeps keeps on growing. I found out yesterday about um, a, universe, uh, a college, a small college in Memphis, Tennessee, um, that is has done a direct, has done a, a cartonera, Memphis cartonera. And this professor, um, also a professor of Spanish, um, I think I wrote down her name here. Um, anyway, I don't remember her name. Um, I will credit it somehow. But anyway, she's got a video on YouTube about the project that they did. They've done it at least a couple of years. It started out as a class um, on the Cartaneras and it has turned into a fellowship, a project where students work with people in the community, different community organizations to create these Cartaneta workshops. Originally it was the students doing it and 
in sort of like a CBL kind of situation. And so um, this was a new video, I think maybe one or two years ago at most. And there are videos coming out every day on YouTube about another person or another community doing some kind of cartoneta. Um, people have um, been doing it in prisons, um, have done, been doing workshops in prisons with people to help them um, um, process their emotions and their situations. Um, they've been doing it. Uh, she mentioned, Raina mentioned children. I've seen other people um, doing these kind of workshops with children, um, uh, different communities, battered women, um, um, LGBTQ, um, many different types of communities um, are continuing to do this. Um, it's perhaps not in the hands, uh, it, it still is. I mean, I, I was impressed to find that there's 300 um, independent uh, publishers and cartoneras around the world in Latin America. Um, so I don't think it's, 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 I think the technology is there, but I think the spirit of people who want to um, bring this to different communities is still live, uh, still alive, um, because it doesn't uh, it, it doesn't require that much. Um, it requires you to have the time. It requires you to have some cardboard, some paints. Uh, they started out with tempura paints, the, some of the cheapest paints that you can possibly use, um, and a paintbrush, um, and then the text. Um, so I think that. Everybody, not everybody has a cell phone. Not everybody has the access to the digital. Um, so I think that um, it's still alive. And I'm surprised every day seeing more and more people that are doing different kinds of projects in their community um, with this Cartaneta idea. That's my opinion. <laughs> That's facts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I, if I can add just yeah. a couple of things about Cartaneta. Like, when the authors who were who were first developing the Cartonera movement uh, and the editors and bookmakers who were working together to develop this art form uh, were writing, producing their stories, in Argentina in particular, it was illegal to write stories about being gay. Mm -hmm. It was illegal to write stories about having romantic relationships with people who, like in non-traditional, non-standard things. Uh, this was not just a radical movement in terms of like publishing industry, uh, but in forms of self-expression. Uh, even to this day, uh, in Latin America, there are many forms of identity that are actively suppressed by laws. Uh, Cartonera has been and still is a form of radical self-expression for people who don't have access to these channels through official culture. Something that we take for granted in this country and anyone who's from a different country or has traveled to other countries knows that we tend to take our freedom of expression for granted here. It's not a given in many other places, especially in Latin America. Um, and this movement expands and proliferates uh, because marginalized people need outlets for self-expression, artistic self-expression. And Cartonera, whether it's a physically like a, uh, like a cardboard book or samistad or like zines that you're producing within your community, uh, these are all like an ecosystem of independent publishing that is essential for people to be able to have their identities represented. I don't think it's it's gone away at all. If anything, it's proliferating uh, even more. Thank uh, you. As culture much. becomes more and more controlled by by the internet. There's a question in chat. Do you have a resources or guidelines page to create a Cartonera workshop that could be used in the community? I don't have one personally, but I'm sure there is one <laughs> on, um, that we can find on online. Um, yeah. Those are the videos that we saw in the box. Yeah, so the, how to make cart to the uh, uh, cart libros de carton or cart cardboard books. There's tons of videos on um, on YouTube. There's, um, there's a lot of organized stuff um, that's happening. The Some of the presentations, that people have been making at conferences and um, in different um, book, uh, what do they call those? Um, book book festivals. Um, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, um, so I think that they definitely, I don't know how much it's been codified, um, 
but there's definitely a lot of material on YouTube um, on how to make card, uh, card, cardboard books. Um, there's people talking about their experience um, with their community or with their workshop. Um, we could develop, perhaps that's a project, you know, <laughs> a summer, you know, yeah. and maybe with a student, um, um, a research project to um, develop something like that um, by looking at some of the resources that are already available. And there are many, there are many. Um, a couple of books just got published of uh, about this Cartonera movement. There was a, another question. Uh, are we are participants going to get to see the recording? And yes, I will put this on the library's YouTube channel, and then we'll share it with everybody who's here, and you know, promote it so other people can watch too who didn't get to to join. So I'll send that to Celeste and everybody else who's registered. So you can rewatch over and over again. <laughs> are there any more questions? Maybe we have one more. Oh, is was no no okay. Anyone online have any questions? Type, feel free to type in chat or just unmute. There's not too many of us, so I think that's okay. Could I ask a question? Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm completely a novice to this entire thing. I was just intrigued by the by the uh, thing I got in the mail from Drexel saying, wouldn't you like to learn about this for two hours? And I was like, yeah, I really want to learn about it. So I need to know more about the movement. First of all, um, if there are books that have been published, if there's something that would you could especially recommend. And then the other thing I'm interested in is when I first started listening, I, I, I thought that this was primarily a movement for maybe people who saw themselves as authors but had not been able to get published with the more mainstream press. But now as I listen more, it really sounds like a much more populist um kind of thing where many people who just want to tell their story could be part of it. Is it more the professional author who hasn't been able to find a place to get published, getting published, or is it really more sort of a populist thing? I think, uh, I think that it's, it's populist. I mean, it started with um, people, writers, as Jennifer mentioned, um, starting the Cartonera in in um, Argentina, in Buenos Aires, and then quickly spread to Brazil and other countries. Um, but the people that were making these books, um, a lot of them were making their living by picking up cardboard, by recycling. Um, that's how they were making their living. And um, it re it transformed the lives of um, not just the writers who were participating, but also people who were marginalized, um, and they became artists and 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 uh, artisans and and publishers. And as as I was mentioning, as I'm looking on YouTube and and everything else, um, there's just so much material out there. Um, I can perhaps send the list once I compile it of the different um, books that have come out, the articles, there's, there's lots and lots of material on YouTube. And I think it's being um, utilized by a lot of communities as a way, as, as uh, Dr. Dalt said, as a way to express um, what can not be expressed in the mainstream. So I, it's more than writers who couldn't get published. It's it's more than that. That's my response. Do you have a response, Dean? <laughs> I agree with you completely. It's a it's a popular art movement. Um, the idea of a professional writer in Latin America, as historically as Jen said, is is a man and a white man at that. Uh, and this is a space that has been historically since since the. Uh, early 2000s and even today is a space for people who are not of that identity uh, to come together around art making. Um, and it's, it's, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Rana posted a few comments in the chat, which I am not gonna, I'm gonna try. <laughs> My Spanish is just embarrassed. That's, that's a comment for Dr. Matos Mendoza. You're talking about taking the exhibition to the consulate. 
Oh, Pebbles and I'm going to read a libro. That's the word I was thinking about. Book festivals. Uh, mm -hmm. Consulado de Mexico. There's a um, question. There's a hand up. Yeah, I I have, uh, you know, since uh, Reina mentioned it, you know, uh, La Feria del Libro, uh, I am the director of education for the Latin American Book Fair project. That's a community led project that started in 2019. And also uh, during the my professional work, I am a librarian and I am very interested and I work for the Free Library of Philadelphia. And I am very uh, interested in um, in this as a workshop, first of all, that we can do it at uh, La Feria del Libro that is going to be in uh, October 12th at Taller Puerto Ricano and maybe do um, a workshop about what a cartonera is uh, and also let a workshop for uh, families and teens that we can do that maybe in, in an hour or so. I think that will be very interested and I don't know who will be the contact person that I can um, discuss with with you and maybe um, you know take the idea a little bit further. So um, if you can let me know, or I can put my email address uh, somewhere, <laughs> so uh, we we can you know that we can talk about that. Sounds wonderful. A mí me gusta la idea. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Is it, do we have everybody's email address? Yes. Yeah, but so I was just checking to make sure before I say yes. Yep, we do. Okay. And don't says, oh. It seems like I'm going to be the contact person for this. <laughs> you just signed yourself up. <laughs> I can make that connection afterwards then. Gracias. <laughs> All right. So um, if we don't have any more questions or comments, um, this food here, and I just want to say a couple of thank yous. Um, thank you to all the panelists, um, to Stacy, to the library, the Academy Library for um, hosting this. Um, I wanted to thank my colleagues, um, Luz Matos Mendoza, Rogelio Mignana, who um, was here earlier, Monserrat Bores. Um, all of them helped me um, in the with the publicity for the first exhibition, and. Um, Luz and Rogelio were both very supportive of us doing this in 2022. Um, I want to thank all the students from 410 that are in this class now, and also all of those who were in the class in 2022. They're not here. Uh, Diana was here, but um, those 30, there were about 30 of them, um, they got this thing going. Um, I want to thank all the Cartanetas all over Latin America and all over the world, because I didn't think this up. It came from someone else. And I also wanted to thank a friend um, who is no longer with us, who I think um, uh, Stacy also knew, Sharon. I, she was the one who originally introduced us, um, and that's how this got started. So um, thank you, everybody. Gracias. Um, ha sido un sueño. This has been wonderful.